not the same as a regular brain. Awesome. Okay. So um, Dr. Zimmerman, welcome. Thanks for being with us today. One more thing, housekeeping, if you, Teresa reminded me, um, if you don't mind to put your name in the chat for record keeping, if you're not getting emails from us and would like to, if you'll add your email as well. So um, good afternoon to you, Dr. Zimmerman. I'm gonna let you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your role in the community and whatever else you'd like to us to know about you personally, and then we'll get started on our trauma conversation. Okay. I'm Clint Zimmerman. Um, I am a pediatrician with Blue Ridge Pediatrics. Um, my wife and I moved here about, uh, let's see, 31 years ago, or no, 30 years ago. So um, I grew up in uh, Knoxville, then um, Atlanta, and um, I went to uh, a little Bible college for a year after graduate for graduation from high school, and then I went to a, a junior, uh, then I came back and went to junior college and really didn't have a, a clear idea of what I wanted to do, so I went to a Georgia Tech and um, I became an industrial engineer for about three years. Uh, I worked at a hospital in Durham. The program that I was in was uh, designed for healthcare, and it gave me an option for going into medicine if I wanted to. And so that was, I was sort of thinking about that. I'd worked some in the hospital as a physical therapy transporter. And, and uh, so uh, after about a year of being in, in engineering, I was in Durham at a hospital there, then I decided to, to um, apply to medical school and uh, didn't get in the first year, got in the second year, went to Wake Forest. And then my senior year in medical school, I rotated with the practice uh, Northwest Children's Clinic, which was, um, uh, at that time it was Bill Horn, Bob Ellison, Pat Geiger. And um, so I went down to Augusta, did my residency and during that time, I met my wife, Stacy, who was a NICU nurse for about 10 years. And uh, we uh, started dating and got married in 91, or let's see, 90. And then um, uh, during that year, we also, um, there was a Northwest Children's Clinic that I talked about earlier. They actually were looking for somebody. Bob Ellison was getting ready to go to Nigeria and, uh, Pat, L, uh, Pat Geiger eventually, I think, went over to the university. And so um, it worked out that uh, we were able to come up here and go into pediatrics. And then about a year after we came up here, we actually started Boone Pediatrics. There was a Dr. Bill Brandenberger and myself and Dr. Adams. And then uh, uh, from that time on, we've uh, sort of hung in there and uh, moved to, into our current building several years ago. And so that's my story. Um, and somebody, Dr. Zimmerman, I don't know if you, I'm sure you remember everybody, but Kelly Bruce Scott is on this yeah. call and she put in the chat that you were her pediatrician and you were my children's pediatrician. And I think probably most people who are on this call, you're either their pediatrician or their children's pediatrician. So most of us do know you and um, have had experience work getting medical care from you. So we're glad you're in this area. Um, and we'll talk some more as we go along. You've always been pretty open about some of your personal experiences that have led you to um, incorporate different things into your life. But so we'll come back around to that. But we've had a lot of conversations about how y'all sometimes see trauma in the children that you work with. But what can you tell us um, about how trauma shows up in a pediatric office? Oh, some, hold on, I might have muted you one second. I don't know. If, hold on. Every time I go to click it. Okay. Nope, still not right. Will you see if you can unmute yourself? I clicked on unmute. Can you hear okay. me? Okay. Yes. Now, thank you. I don't know if I did that or what happened, but my apologies. So how do you see trauma in your office? Well, thanks, first of all, Denise, for sort of raising this topic over the last several years as you have because um, you know giving it a name sort of helps you recognize it and see it in all of its different forms and uh, and it's funny I guess we we see it a lot of different ways we actually inflict it in some ways I guess um, you know I, I think about trauma with uh, you know when kids are born into the world uh, certainly that can be traumatic but 
you know, sometimes we uh, do certain procedures that may lead to the diagnosis of something like, uh, you know, tumor or, um, you know, some heart condition or something like that. And, and that's traumatic, although it's not typically what I think y'all are thinking about, but at the same time, it is traumatic. And um, I guess the difference in some of those experiences is it's not necessarily hidden, whereas a lot of trauma uh, can be hidden from uh, least uh, from discovery. Um, when, when you mentioned this, I, I'm thinking about a, a young girl that we saw several years ago, and uh, she was coming into the office, seemed like frequently, and, and there are sometimes where we see people and you don't have a real clear sense for what's going on. She came in with a lot of sore throats and you know we uh, would see her do a strep test. And it was always negative and we didn't think too much about it. And I remember one Saturday morning, um, I looked at her and she was getting on the scale. So I thought, man, this girl's lost some weight. And so I looked and she was clearly anorectic at that time. And so um, because of that, I, uh, she was actually followed, I think. Uh, come on, Pippa. My border collie is, uh, or grand border collie is uh, needed to be let out, but. Demanding attention. Exactly. So, uh, so this young girl uh, came in, she started, um, they, they directed more of their focus towards this anorexia. And I think as a part of that, she started getting some counseling and part of that led to the discovery that she had actually been being sexually abused by her father or stepfather. And uh, so ultimately, um, you know, there, there was a physical complaint, which really didn't seem like a whole lot, but that led to looking at some other issues that ultimately I think led to some counseling and, and sort of helped to uncover some of that trauma that had been there. And, you know, I think of a lot of kids we have with um, abdominal pain. Yeah. We, uh, yeah. that a bit. okay. Sorry. Go ahead. Didn't understand, or, um, I'm sure there are many, many complaints that people come in for that when, when people describe their complaints to us, we look and we do all kinds of tests and nothing really shows up. And um, I'm, I'm sure that sometimes those can ultimately manifest as, or it can be revealed that they have trauma. Think about another little girl that um, she actually went to Hardin Park and uh, she, there was, there was a lot of dysfunction. I think as time went on, we, real, we realized it, but uh, she ended up having what appeared to be seizures, but in reality, we're not seizures based on abnormal, an abnormal EEG, but they were pseudo seizures. And it turned out that this child had been, I think there was, uh, the stepdad was, uh, sexually abusing her and, and I think there was actually a pornography ring being run out of the house so um those are you know a couple things but um you know well but, when we talk sorry to interrupt you when we talk about you you referred to the kind of trauma that we typically talk about and when we talk about you know those adverse childhood experiences and those 10 original things that we think about physical emotional <laughs> sexual abuse physical emotional neglect divorce, separation, incarceration, addiction, those kinds of things. But that was in the mid nineties. And that list has expanded so significantly that now we do talk about either a child's, you know, chronic or extensive medical um, issues or a parent's medical issues. And then all the other community violence, natural disasters, accidents, bullying, discrimination, that list has expanded so much. And so, um, you know, even, even with no other additional trauma, a chronic medical issue and all the invasive procedures and all of those things can be trauma, traumatic all on its own. So I'm sure y'all see a wide range from solely just chronic medical illness all the way to when other types of abuse are complicating what looks to be like a medical illness and maybe is not. Yeah, and, and then, you know, I, I think about some of these kids where they have chronic medical conditions 
it, it not only is restricted to that child, but it actually involves the entire family because a lot of family attention is diverted to that one child with medical problems. But then that means that sometimes the, some of the other kids may not receive as much attention. And, you know, the best of parents will try to balance that out, but even then it can be a challenge and those kids can come out with other behavioral kind of issues, so. And yeah, that's a good point. Um, and I know, I think back to my own child, when she was about four, she had chronic medical stuff and stomach stuff and constantly stomach was hurting and we brought her for lots of doctor's visits. I think it, maybe it was you that sent us to Charlotte. She had a bunch of tests down there and they did find chronic acid reflux, but somebody along the way was like, and this may also seem triggered by anxiety. And now in my mind, even though I've worked in this field forever, I was like, she's four, like, what does she have to be anxious about? And now that she's 17 and diagnosed with a chronic anxiety disorder, you know, I think back to that and wonder how much of that played into what was happening with her back then. But that was one of those cases where on the surface, you know, people constantly say, but what does it look like? How will I recognize it? And you look at us, the, our family, and we look like we're supposed to, you know, do all the right things and stereotypical functional family. And still there's some things going on that maybe impact our, our health. Um, and some of it we don't even know about. So I just think about um, some of those things where maybe there's things going on that y'all really don't even know what it is. And later on, maybe we find out, um, you know, some complicating factors or something like that. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I think about our office sometimes when, you know, if, if there are issues going on at the office and we have big office problems, that'll divert my attention away from maybe needs that, that some of my kids have. And then um, I might become a little bit disconnected and then I have to be aware to try to um, constantly monitor that so I can stay connected with our kids. And, so. Yeah, you, you, your voice sound was fine and then now it's kind of gone down a little bit i don't know if it's the angle um thank you so yeah when we talk about y'all how y'all see trauma in your office it sounds like it can be a range from medical trauma to um oh and you said sometimes we inflict the trauma that's poor grace is always my example for everything but when she was two i don't know if you remember this she was running barefoot on our deck and she got um a hot, like a splinter, it seemed like the size of a popsicle stick. And I brought her down there and you were the one that came in and we had to hold her down while y'all tried to get her out, that out of her foot. I know it's traumatic for me. And when she talks about things that she remembered that were traumatic, she brings that up. She was only two. So the fact that she remembers that, but she remembers the jacket that she was wearing even. And so sometimes even if the best of intentions, you know, of making an event um, be as comfortable as possible, there's trauma that comes that the, the body remembers. We talk a lot about the body remembers. So um, that was interesting that you mentioned that, that sometimes y'all inflict trauma when you have to and don't want to. Shots, I think of shots and new parents, every time I would take my kids for shots and get sick to my stomach and, you know, then they cry and there's nothing I can do about it. And so all of those things, but um, any other thoughts? I also think about a lot of the kids that we've worked with together, um, either from the school system or that parents have talked to me about that range everything from, does my child have attention deficit disorder to um, they seem really anxious, but I don't wanna go to a counseling center. I, I'd rather go to my pediatrician to, um, you know, where there's domestic violence going on in the home and that, that's showing up in the kid's behavior or the kid's performance or the kid's health when it's actually something to do with what the, what's going on with the parents and some of those things that we've shared as well. Oh, yeah. I remember a toddler one time that came in and uh, his gait was really abnormal and, uh, and unfortunately, it was a sad situation. The mom had of breast cancer ultimately which she died from but the dad was an alcoholic and the dad had evidently stored some form of alcohol whether it was wine or whatever i don't know it was in a bottle in the fridge and the child got a hold of it so when the child came in and was wobbly they were actually drunk and um mm. so that was some uh you know some uh alcohol in the family and um 
you know, we see behavior, ADD. Um, I remember seeing one child and, and um, I would see him a lot. He was extremely anxious, but his mom and dad had gone through a divorce. And, and I don't, you know, there's always a combination that child has some, in, some um, temperament issues that they were born with, but there's also sometimes how parents handle these things. And from what I understand that, that sometimes parents, if they overcompensate, then that makes it hard for them to set limits. And I remember this child came in one day and, and uh, he was extremely anxious about having strep test on us. So uh, mom, mom said, okay, what's it gonna take? And he was like 11 or 12. She said, okay, what's it gonna take? And so she started saying, okay, five, 10, 15, 20. So she paid him a $20 bill on the spot to do a strep test. Um, but I think sometimes a failure to set and enforce effective limits can actually enhance anxiety. Um, you know, so. Yeah, when you mentioned ADD, so let me, the, my disclaimer is I'm not saying ADD doesn't exist because everyone in my family has ADD and my mom's not allowed to drive anyone in her car unless she's had her medication. So not saying ADD does not exist. But um, that's one of the things that Dean Burke Harris talks about in her TED talk is it used to be, and I remember this, I've worked in the school system 30 years. So it used to be we'd fill out a Connors rating scale and send them over to the pediatricians. And um, there might not be a whole lot of discussion about what else was going on. And I've watched over time. Um, now there seems to be a lot more discussion about what else is going on, you know, with the child and the family beyond just these like few symptoms that we're looking on on a rating scale. And so that's one of the thing that Dean Burke Harris says is that a lot of trauma symptoms can look like ADD symptoms and that responsibility to make sure you're pulling out, you know, what's really happening here and not just automatically diagnosing something when there's some other things happening. And I know that y'all, y'all are careful to do that as well. Yeah. I and that's, um, I'm like you, I mean, I know it exists, but, uh, you know, a lot of people have an inattentiveness and impulsivity, but if, if you don't look and see, okay, what's going on in that child's family? What, what are they dealing with? What have they had to deal with? Um, you know, is there, I remember one child from Blowing Rock that only discovered through talking to the teacher that, that the dad was an alcoholic and that there's a lot of chaos in the home because of that, but he was having some attention problems, but there's a lot bigger picture than just um, an isolated set of behaviors. And, and I think the danger in sometimes looking at these behavior scales is you, you, you know, what, what are the relationships going on with the child, with his parents? And, and so if, if you don't look at those, then I, I don't feel like I've done a good job, so. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> All right, so let's talk a little bit about all the things y'all do to help strengthen and create resilience with kids and with families. Um, I've got some ideas in my head that I know from being with y'all for 22 years, but um, what can you tell us about some of the supports that y'all help put in place for kids and families? Um, you know, I think from, from the moment. Oh, there it came back. They went out for a second, it's back now, go ahead. Okay, so from the moment a child comes in, um, and we try to build relationships with the parents and with the child, and um, you know I think that's crucial. Uh, developing sort of a trusting relationship where the parents truly feel like I have their best interest and the child's best interest at heart, and uh, building credibility by. Um, developing that relationship both in the office but also calling back and and uh, taking a genuine interest one of the things i try to do is to to look at the family as a, a system um going back again to my training at tech I, we were systems engineers and so we looked not just at one isolated component but really the whole family system you know what does the mom do? What does the dad do? How many kids are there? What do they do? What are their interests? And you know, I think as as we try to do that, then when you know Grace or Isaiah or other people come into the office, we can uh, if we have that information in the chart, then I can 
sort of pick up where I left off and try to fill in the gaps and say, okay, Isaiah, so you're finishing up your years at state. Uh, what do you think about your future? Or for that high school uh, student who's, um, you know, coming in for a checkup, I like to ask him, okay, what, what are your thoughts about your future? Are you going to go to college or, you know, do you want to um, do something in the trades or so I think developing relationships by looking at things beyond just the traditional medical uh, approach and, and trying to show a genuine interest in them. Um, when, when kids come in, you know, part of it depends on the situation. Um, I saw somebody from the CDSA and, and we make a lot of referrals to the CDSA in the first three years of life. Uh, you know, sometimes it can be a high risk situation. Sometimes it may be something as as simple as torticollis and, and uh, where a child is turning their head to one direction, but sometimes it can be, you know, this child was in foster care and, and uh, there's uh, substance abuse in the home and the parents incarcerated. And, um, you know, we, we have, um, when uh, moms deliver, we have a, a scale to assess the, uh, postpartum pregnancy uh, or postpartum depression. And so we, we screen for that. And, and if a mom screens positive, then we'll try to refer them or make sure they get the help they need if, if they want. Um, you know, kids are coming up. We, we have a rating scale to look at evidence for anxiety as they get older in adolescence. And we also try to screen for high risk behavior, you know, sexual activity, substance abuse, things like that. And, and again, by trying to maintain a, um, a good relationship, then um, we can counsel them, make referrals, um, and try to encourage them as, as they come in. We also um, try to take advantage of the different resources under the Children's Council through the years has provided a lot of resources. Um, and you know, thankful for that. Also, um, I have in the past. I'm not doing anything right now, but we um, have talked to uh, parents and have uh, done some classes in Love and Logic, and just helping parents to, uh, you know, try to find better tools to help their child. Um, you know, I've learned that that I've I've been a real enthusiast. Not everybody else is, is that way, and that's okay because um, we each have our different styles. But uh, I, I love love and logic because it allows you to remain calm. Um, I know about 16 years ago, I was struggling as a parent, and I'll sometimes share that with people because, um, you know, it's hard to, to be honest with somebody if you feel like they've never struggled or had any problems. And so I figured, you know, if I can let them know I'm human too, then hopefully that'll open the door for some to uh, to be honest about their own struggles. I had a mom last night who was uh, had a little toddler in the room and you know they've been waiting a while and he was going nuts and so I um, you know try to, to be open and yet not pushy. That's um, I'm finding that if I'm too pushy that can push people away so I don't, don't want to do that. But um, Love and Logic has some great online stuff available right now. And um, they're transitioning to, uh, they're working more with the aiming clinics. But, so those are some of the kinds of things that we do. Um, you mentioned that high risk um, behavior screener. I know when my kids each turned, I guess it's maybe 13 or around that time. And one of the things that I thought was so interesting is that you have us, the parents step out of the room. And for both of them, that was the first time, although they've both done counseling later in their lives, that was the first time that they, I think it was presented to them that they, they had an autonomy where they could speak to an adult in their own interest. And so um, it was an interesting conversation after that screening because part of them was really kind of surprised by that, that the parent was out of the room and they got asked the questions about substance abuse and sexual activity and depression and all of those things. But then there was, for people who have conversations at their house, there was a really good conversation about why 
would somebody ask that? And there are houses where you're not free to say um, or ask things about those types of topics. And so this gives somebody an opportunity to have those conversations with someone who's safe. So I, I'm sure not every parent appreciates those questions, but I really did. Not only because y'all were interested in those things with them, if I hadn't thought to be, but because it did give them that sense of they get to speak on their behalf. And I thought that was a really powerful thing for them. Yeah, I think it can be. It's interesting. Um, you know, as, as I've watched my own kids grow up, I realized that, that um, there's a gradual emergence from birth to adulthood that, that they become their own person and they're born with their own temperaments. Um, some parents have an easier time of, of acknowledging that and dealing with that than others. Some parents, if we um, you know, just being sensitive to that, um, I think about one of the abuse situations that we encountered several years ago as a young girl who came in, and it was a strange dynamic in that uh, the mom was pretty meek and mild and the two girls were and this dad was sort of a domineering kind of person and seemed like they moved around a lot she came in initially because she had some um what they thought was rectal bleeding well it turned out it was vaginal bleeding and then when they did an x-ray she had three batteries in her vagina and then ultimately she was hospitalized and in a and but, but the dynamic was that this dad didn't want to let them speak anything out of, um, he didn't want to let them interact with anybody unless he was present. And, and looking back now, that was a big warning sign that when you have somebody that seems to be uber controlling, that can be a um, concern. And we definitely have some of that in the office. So. Yeah, it's, and I see that in the school systems too. I'm sure we all do in our different job roles about those dynamics of, and I like that you said family system. That's a big thing about social worker systems too. And you're not going to deal with one part of the system without dealing with the whole system and tinkering with one part's going to change the dynamics of the whole thing. But it's so interesting to me to watch the power dynamics and who's, who looks like they're in charge, who says they're in charge and who is actually in charge trying to navigate all that can be a delicate balance. There was a question in the chat about, because one of the things that um, ACEs work does is talk to us about the relationship between obesity and trauma or ACEs. Um, and so the question was, do you see a lot in terms of children from trauma and um, the issue of obesity? You mentioned anorexia, but they're wondering about on the opposite end of the continuum and obesity. I think there is. It's interesting. Uh, you know, we have in, in our office, we have in our computerized medical record, we have a, a growth chart. And, and what's interesting is that there could be a number of different reasons for this, but sometimes you'll see a child who seems to be coming along and they're pretty much within a normal range. And then at some point in time, there's a, a shift and this child all of a sudden starts gaining a lot of weight. And then you look after a period of three, four, five years that they've risen well above the 99th percentile on their BMI curve. And so sometimes I'll try to go back and ask, okay, um, you know, if it is a divorce situation or, or any number of different things, and I'm sure there's, there's actually a lot more than I, that I'm aware of, but sometimes you can go back and, and say, well, I noticed they started gaining weight when they were five. Did anything else happen when they were five? Well, yeah, that's when we got divorced or that's when, uh, you know, dad went to jail or, or it could be any number to, or that's when step back. And so, so yeah, being aware of that and realize that there could be connections. Uh, you may not always recognize exactly what it is, but I think it's helpful to sort of tuck in into your, uh, you know, to be aware of that. Um, Nadine Burke Harris in her book, The Deepest Well, she uh, cites a child who just didn't grow. And at some point in time he was growing and then he stopped. And uh, 
I think that was a time where there was some major trauma that had occurred in the family. And, you know, it's interesting when you look at, um, you know, when you have a surge of hormones and steroids, sometimes that can cause your growth rate to, uh, depending on how it plays out, it can cause it to uh, your bones to stop growing prematurely, so. Yeah, it's so interesting the way our, our brains and our chemicals are all connected in that way. Um, okay, so you talked about referrals, building safe relationships, which I love. That's one of my favorite things about offsetting trauma is positive, consistent, caring relationships. Um, and I know, <laughs> I don't know if everybody feels this way, but I definitely feel like y'all are as much about supporting the parents. Um, I remember when Lija was about eight months old, he got third degree burns on the inside of his hand. He, you know debate about the walkers. He's in a walker and rolled over to the monitor heater and stuck his hand in it and got third degree burns all over the inside of his hand. And we came to see Dr. Adams. I'll never forget this. And um, he wrapped it up and sent us out and said, now if they pop, you have to come right back because we may, we're going to have to cut all that dead skin off to keep it from getting infected. And right as I was putting him in his car seat and he's waving his hands around and one of them hit me and I felt it pop. So we went right back in there. And um, he was like, yeah, we're gonna have to um, cut all this dead skin. You're gonna have to hold down this eight month old and we're gonna have to cut off all this dead skin. And I must've gone pale. And he said to me, I said, I don't think I can do that. And he said, this is the moment where you get to decide what kind of parent you're gonna be. You're either gonna sit on the sidelines and let other people console your child or you're gonna step up and be, you know, part of this was, that's happening to them. And he kicked a trash can over to me. I guess I looked like I was going to vomit on top of it. He took Elijah from me, kicked a trash can over my way. And it was just so like straightforward. And I had grown up in all kinds of dysfunction and people not being available. And, you know, it was such a moment of clarity for me, but I have felt that support that may not seem like support to some people, but it, it was what I needed to hear at the time. And I went down there and did what I needed to do and have since then. But I have always felt like y'all were as much trying to support us through the process of being parents to a sick child as you were trying to heal a sick child. And whether it was our anxiety about what was coming next or trying to help us figure out what was going on. So I imagine that's true for most parents that y'all are as much trying to support them through being parents as you are trying to heal their children. Yeah, and we try to be, um, you know, sometimes when accidents occur like that in other accidents, uh, there can be a tendency for the parent to beat themselves up. And, you know, I try to let them know, hey, listen, stuff has happened to me, our kids, you know, so now's not a time to beat yourself up. Um, it is, it's interesting, sometimes kids' responses early on is, is when their child's getting shots or, vaccines and how they tolerate that and you know if they can uh I don't, I, it's just interesting um the parents response and trying to help them through that in in a healthy way so. yeah um that's interesting you say judging because we actually took him to the er first and the er was so um disapproving of us that I was actually afraid they might call social services because they were very judgmental about the fact that he was in a walker. How could he roll over to the heater without us seeing it? It was like in an instant. And then by the time we got to Dr. Adams, he was like, you know, things happen, accidents happen. This is, you know, there'll be more, <laughs> more accidents after this one. And so there was definitely that distinct difference between being judgmental and being, being supportive that you know, both of those felt really different to us. So I've seen that firsthand. Um, okay, so we talked about all the ways that y'all try to help build strength in children and families. Um, and I'll just stop and take a breath for a second. If anybody has any questions or thoughts they'd like to share, you're welcome to put those in the chat and I will read them to Dr. Zimmerman. Um, let's talk a little bit about how you stay well because I can only imagine um, I have been in there at times when y'all are back to back and waiting rooms are full and I can hear all the exam rooms full and 
the types of things that you hear. I know I was on the child fatality team for a while and the things that y'all see. So um, can you talk to me a little bit about how you managed to stay healthy and well yourself? Um, sometimes I do well, sometimes not. Um, so um, I try not to over obligate myself in too many activities outside the office. And, you know, um, I, I do, you know, we are uh, trying to maintain friendships. Uh, I have a group of guys that, that I meet with on Wednesday mornings just to um, sort of, you know, just share life with, um, you know, and we could process things. Uh, and, and that's helpful for me, a real uh, important thing that I do. Um, we each uh, we have it structured so that we have one day off a week. I'm off Wednesdays and, uh, and I have stuff that comes up and within reason, I try to uh, get caught up on those days. And, but I, again, I try not to get over obligated because um, I think that's, uh, it's really easy to do that. Early on in, in my, um, when I started working, there was a book I read called Margin by a guy named Richard Swenson, and he's written several other books about overload and things like that. So I try to take that stuff to heart and realize that, you know, if you don't cre create enough margin in your personal life, in your professional life, then um, you find yourself getting too many things done or getting, getting too much stuff going on. And then when something does happen, you don't have any capacity to handle that um, trauma or that uh, events. So creating margin, I think, is, is important. Uh, developing and maintaining close relationships. Um, we try to stay pretty connected with our uh, family. Uh, you know, I have, uh, very blessed, I have a sister that um, lives at Virginia Beach, her brother in Atlanta, and another brother in D.C., and then a sister in Alabama. And so we have a uh, every two week Zoom call with the family, and that's a good thing. And uh, um, so for me, relationships are a lot of what it is. Um, I'm trying to do a better job about planning fun things. Uh, we have a Disney family vacation coming up in December, and I'm looking forward to that. Oh, I'm so jealous. Had a couple of weddings this past year, so that was uh, fun, stressful, but fun. Um, yeah, Disney is the place <laughs> we went when the kids were older. Like, I never understood taking kids in a stroller to Disney, but you got to go when you got to go. But the extent, like, even more than the rides, like, that I walk out and they pressure wash the sidewalks in the night that I didn't have to cook or clean. And after I came home, I went through a two-week depression where I was like, this is not as fun as Disney. <laughs> like, adulting is not as fun. So Disney is fantastic. I love Disney. Um, someone asked if you could say the name of the author of the margin book again. His name is Richard Swenson, S-W-E-N-S-O-N or S-E-N, I think. Got it. Oops, I typed that back to one person instead of everybody. One second. Let me send that to everybody so they got it written down. Then, um, another, oh, this is an excellent question. Are you seeing more anxiety or social emotional challenges with children born within this pandemic? Lots of children have not had an opportunity for socialization with others during these past several months, almost two years. Yeah, I think so. Um, you, know, I, you know, I think the whole anxiety thing, I didn't realize it was as rampant as it is, but um, when you look at the people complete these histories and family history of anxiety with mom, with dad, and then with the child. And again, I think there's a temperamental component, but there's also a, how do parents respond to certain things and events. But on top of that, um, you know, there's so much information now out about COVID, the Delta variant, uh, what's going to happen with that. Um, you know, now with the schools, do we wear a mask? Do we not wear a mask? Who's been vaccinated? When do you get vaccinated? What's the vaccination? Is it safe? Uh, 
um, you know, all that kind of stuff really, uh, to me, it's fascinating because again, who would have thought a year and a half ago that a little virus in Wuhan, China could have brought about this radical transformation of society across the globe. And, and so again, when you look at a system, the, the world system, sometimes people tend to think, well, it's a nice, like, you know, I'm, I'm in my own little bubble. I'm not, you know, I'm not around anybody else. Therefore, I don't have to worry about vaccines. Well, you know, if, if COVID hasn't proven that you're not, then I don't know what will. Uh, but, but definitely, uh, you know, people are worried about going back to school because if they go, are they going to get infected? But um, at the same time, if you don't have those relationships, for me, that's, that's something that going back to your question, that's what keeps me sane is having good relationships with, within my family and with friends. And, and so if you don't have those, I personally don't do very well. Um, you know, so, so definitely I think it's on the rise and, um, yeah. You're, I can't yep, I muted myself. My daughter's walking around the background, so I muted myself going in and out. Um, somebody said my older daughter experienced significant and chronic developmental trauma related to medical issues and having to hold her. Um, small body for invasive procedures and tests was a reoccurring part of the trauma. I've often reflected about this terrible process and how her adult body holds, quote unquote, holds the trauma now. Like Denise, I'm thankful for Dr. Zimmerman, Lennis, and Adams for the support they gave her during those early years. So uh, more acknowledgement about the support that y'all give us. It made me think when my son was two, two and a half, um, he got put in the hospital i um, trying to figure out what, what was wrong with him. This may have been you too, Dr. Zimmerman. And so and when they were admitting him, they had to put an IV in his arm. And um, it was a combination of me trying to hold him down because he was fighting, but also like connecting him in his eyes and singing the ABC song. Finally got it in, got him put in a room. My mom came and when she walked in, he said in his two and a half year old voice, Mimi, they tried to kill me. And she's a therapist. And so she helped him process that. But in his mind, he doesn't know what an IV is. He doesn't know that that's temporary. He doesn't know that the end result of that is not death. And so, you know, when he was processing that whole experience, I had been processing it as a parent who was, you know, having to do the stressful thing with my child. But, you know, the knowledge that he thought that somebody was, he was going to die was definitely a sobering thing. And just how kids interpret medical events, so children. But um, so more appreciation for the support that you give us as parents. Um, let's see. So you were talking about friendships and relationships, staying well. I know you've talked with me a lot about love and logic and how critical that's been for you and what you feel like is your mental and emotional health, whether it's love and logic or, or some other form of support. Um, I think parenting is the hardest thing I've ever done. And I don't know how people do it without help and support. So definitely a plug for, um, again, <laughs> My poor children, if they knew how much I talked about them, but when Elijah's about three, he was in the bathtub and it was time, to, he liked the water to go up as high as it could, you know, it could go up to his neck, he'd let it. And I was like, you have to turn off the water. And he's like, no. And I just taken love and logic. And I said, okay, you have a choice. The water has to go off. Do you want to turn it off for me? And he said, not me, not you, we're leaving it on. And I thought, oh, I'll have to keep doing some trainings with this <laughs> round one is not gonna work for us. And so I continued to do those kind of given choices things. But um, so I know that you have had a strong um, affinity for that kind of emotional regulation sort of support that helps you be a better parent. Well, and I think even in the office, um, I'll model that with, hey, do you want to sit on the table? Do you want to sit in mom's lap? Do you want to, you want to look at your right hand or your left hand? Or, you know, when, whenever they begin to understand this, you know, two, three of this whole concept of choices, it just gives them more control. And 
you know, Carla, our lab tech, when she's drawing blood, um, she does a great job about doing that, trying to distract people, help them to get off their mind off of, you know, things that hurt. You know, we had a child in just a couple of days ago that burned his, uh, he picked up something that was hot and burned his two fingers. And so, um, yeah, sometimes having to restrain people, but at least to try to do it in a loving way and try to, uh, you know, get them distracted. Um, I think something else you sort of mentioned it or touched on is, you know, we each want to have get a sense that somebody listens to us and they validate our experience. Um, sometimes people, not, you know, they're well-intended, but they'll say things like, well, that doesn't hurt. Well, you know, one thing I've learned is, is that everybody's, hurt and pain is real to them and I have to be real careful I don't minimize that and I don't uh, I don't want to blow it up and it's worse than it should be um, but but if you try to minimize that a lot then you're you know that can be a, a bad thing so helping people to to uh, learn how to validate their child's pain without necessarily um, I mean sometimes for instance parents you know, their child doesn't want to do a strep test. And, and I get that and understand that. I think the ones who seem to do it the best are the ones that can say things like, yeah, I know it hurts, you know, I'm sorry, uh, but it's going to be over with in just a little bit. And then after the event, then you just sort of move on. And, and it seems like those kids are a lot more able to be able to cope with difficult things because, yeah, sometimes life is painful, but knowing that you're going to go through it, uh, but looking beyond that is, can be very helpful. So. Yeah. Um, one person said, yeah, that's funny when your kids start using love and logic on you as the parent. <laughs> then you know you've done something when they're like, well, mom, I'm going. Do you want me to go in the car or on foot? <laughs> You're like, that's not how that works. Um, so if you have anything that you'd like to say to Dr. Zimmerman, I will copy everything in the chat and email it to him so he can read it when he has time to do that, whether it's a question or just a comment. Um, we've talked about a lot of stuff, Dr. Zimmerman. Anything that you can think of that you'd like to cover before we sign off that we haven't talked about yet? I don't know of anything. You mentioned another thing that we do to keep ourselves sane. And Stacy. Um, it was the one who got this uh, grand dog for my daughter. And, and before that, we had another border collie. And, and uh, we look forward to our days going over to the dog park. But, but truly, this animal has been such a great uh, source of joy. When I come home in the afternoon, you know, she's up and eager to, to greet me. And, and, um, and I, I think, you know, one thing I've learned, too, is just the idea of, of being able to help others sort of gets you out of your own little world. And when when people are appreciative and they say thank you, then then that helps me to deal with whatever other stuff I'm dealing with at the moment. So yeah, that is um a good point. I have never been a dog person and Grace talked us into getting a dog last fall that her counselor got on board and helped recommend as well. And it just changes the energy in the house. Um, it's just different. And so I, people now like, see, you are a dog person. I'm like, no, this is not actually a dog. This is like a spirit animal. I'm still not a dog person, but um, he definitely has added a lot to our family. Um, Teresa Goss said that she really appreciates you making referrals for North Carolina infant toddler, toddler program eligibility. You're always right. So thank you for that. Um, one thing I did want to go back to when you were talking about the whole child and do you want to go to college or do you want to do a trade? That's not just true for you. I just want to brag on Michelle Loop come in a little bit because she last couple of times Grace has been there. Michelle's been the one with openings. And um, for those of you who don't know Grace, she chooses her own path. And so Michelle was talking to her about what do you want to do when you get out of high school? And she was like, yeah, I'm going to graduate early and take a gap year and try to be an artist. And most adults in the world are always like, you know, just kind of shocked by that whole plan. And Michelle was really cool about it. And yeah, 
if you're not, if your heart's not in college, no reason to go pay for it right now. I told her this long story about her sister, who's an artist and was just really comfortable with whatever Grace was saying. And I really appreciate that because she's kind of trying that plan out on adults in the world. And she gets a wide range of emotions from uh, reactions from disapproval to support. And so um, I, it's not just you in that office, I think, that tries to really support and encourage children to be who they are. So I appreciated that that day. She handled that really well. Thanks, thanks. I think so, we in our own way try to, try to do that and affirm the kids. And Yeah, we feel that. So any other comments for Dr. Zimmerman, you're welcome to put those in the chat. I know you've got a lot to do on your day off, Dr. Zimmerman. So we're gonna go ahead and let, we're gonna sign off, but I so appreciate you being with us. We appreciate what y'all do there. It's definitely one of those high intensity jobs that, um, that I'm impressed and admire the way in which y'all do it. So thanks for what y'all do and for being with us. And I look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you, thank you very much. All right, hope you have a good rest of your day. All right, thank you.